and then we'll get started. Okay. How's everyone doing? I hope well. Yes, good. <laughs> All right, we are going to get started. Um, well, yes, one, one second. myself. Okay. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today, this evening, um, this afternoon. Um, I'm grateful to, to have you here. I know that it's late in the afternoon, so it is um, a joy to have you here. I'm Sherry Watkins. Um, I am a senior research fellow here in the Center for Teaching Research and Learning at American University. And today we will be talking about working and advancing towards equity and anti-racism. And I will be sharing some perspectives from faculty for, for you. Let me just make sure that we don't have any interruptions. All right, so I'm going to share my screen. Can everyone see my screen? I can't see it. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Yes, perfect. Okay, very good. So, um, wonderful. All right. So before we get started, I just would like to make sure that I just want to share some um, norms for engagement. Sherry, should we be seeing your slides? No, we don't see your slides. I think you're muted, Sherry. That yeah, so I was asking, can 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 you all see my my slides? No. Okay, let's try it again. All right. All right. Can you see my slides now? Can can you all see yes. my slides? Yep, we can yes. see them now. Okay, perfect. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right. So before we get um, started, I just want to share some rules for how we will engage with each other um, today. And I won't go through and read them um, because I'm sure you can read as well as I can or better, but they certainly focus on um, just having some engaged humility, uh, being respectful of each other's opinions, um, watching our body language, um, thinking about safety and comfort, and actually um, thinking about where we are in terms of our learning and pushing it. Um, today, we have two session outcomes. Um, the first focuses on us really thinking about or uh, becoming aware of some of the strategies and practices that our colleagues um, and fellow AU faculty faculty are currently engaged in to center equity and anti-racism, and then really to think about our own individual and collective commitments and actions as it relates to equity and anti-racism. And so I'm going to jump right in here and um, all right, all right, all right. And so the slide that I'm sharing with you are anecdotes from faculty. So in thinking about oftentimes um, as faculty, we are all find ourselves busy and um, we're often sometimes siloed. We don't 
get opportunities to engage with other colleagues and faculty as much as we would like to. And so um, I shared this slide with you to help us to situate ourselves in thinking about what is anti-racism. Um, and so we see here today that there are a few anecdotes from our faculty and that and thinking about what does anti-racism mean to them. And so what we can see um, is that um, faculty have some varied ideas around what is anti-racism and that anti-racism defining that is really complex. complex. Um, we see that um, it is active, right? It is something that requires action. And so um, we see that some faculty say that being anti-racist means having an impact which exists beyond the curriculum design, but in that expectations that um, you as a faculty member care about your students. We see that um, it, it involves being proactive and disentangling impacts of racism while also lifting up the voices of those students that are underrepresented. Um, we see that it means treating all of your students with respect and dignity, viewing and seeing all of your students as highly capable and not blaming your students, but interrogating the system and making sure that all of your students have the same opportunities to self-actualize and to be free from oppression. We see that it involves thinking about everything using an anti-racist lens and that that should be reflected in your pedagogy, your curriculum, and your teaching. Um, that it involves creating a space where e all of your students can participate equally. That it means actively identifying, understanding, and opposing racism. And that hopefully we can have healthier discussions in our class and that we're there to help and to support our students to see racism as an interwoven thread throughout any topic. And so as I share these perspectives of our fellow AU uh, colleagues with you, I invite you to also to think about what does anti-racism mean to you and to engage um, in this conversation with me as we proceed throughout this workshop. And so I would invite each of you to begin to silently reflect, or if you'd like to share um, um, your answers to the following prompts and, and yes or no is sufficient here. Do you examine historical roots and contemporary manifestations of racial justice and discrimination? Do you explore the influence of race and culture on your own personal and professional attitudes and behaviors? Do you identify and counteract bias and stereotyping in learning materials? Do you deal with racial tensions and conflicts in the classroom? Do you identify appropriate anti-racist resources to incorporate into the curriculum in your specific subject area? Do you develop new approaches to teaching students using multiple cognitive approaches to diverse learning styles? Do you identify appropriate assessment procedures and practices? Do you assess the hidden curriculum and make it more inclusive and reflective of all of your students' experiences? And finally, do you ensure that your course policies and practices are consistent with your equity goals? I'm going to give each of us a moment to um, reflect on this and um, to answer yes or no. And in your reflections, if you responded yes to this, I encourage you to think how, if you did respond yes to this, what does that yes look like? Are you modestly doing this? Are you doing this extraordinarily well? And if you responded no to many of these things, think of or many of these prompts, think about ways that you can reframe your no's to yeses.
Oops. Okay. And so in thinking about being anti-racist, Dr. Ibram Kendi in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, said that we can all knowingly strive to be an anti-racist, but that being an anti-racist requires uh, persistent self-awareness, constant self-reflection, and regular self-examination. So I thank you all for um, thinking about the prompts and engaging in self-reflection. Reflection is necessary for us to think about equity and anti-racism and the ways that we address that in our teaching, our research, or our service. And so at AU, how are we here? How are we thinking about um, equity and anti-racism? So there are many conversations that are happening at AU around equity and anti-racism. And so we could start with thinking about our AU Inclusive Excellence Plan. But there are also many focused initiatives, um, which include initiatives on equity, educational equity and justice, thinking about um, how is DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, reflected in hiring practices and in the tenure and promotion guidelines. Also thinking about what does it mean to be equity, equitable, and ethical in STEM? Um, what does it, having a sense of belonging mean to our students who are marginalized and also our faculty? How do we create anti-racist communities, whether that's in our classrooms, our departments, or our colleges? And then how do we build equity-minded leaders? There are also conversations around equity and anti-racism that are occurring in our faculty learning communities. Um, there are many faculty learning communities that focus on um, equity, diversity, inclusion. Um, there are many faculty that are engaged in grants and funding that help us to think about equity, such as um, how do we retain um, STEM pre-service and in-service teachers who are working in underrepresented schools. There are also institutional reports and recommendations that are focused on inclusive pedagogy. Um, our very own Center for Teaching, Research and Learning has program that is focused around um, equity and inclusion. And that can be seen um, as reflected in the teaching and learning department or in the research department. And so we come to this idea or this study in thinking about what strategies and practices are AU faculty currently engaged in to center anti-racism and equity in their teaching? And so in order to think about how do faculty or to analyze the experiences of the faculty and how they are addressing racism and equity in their teaching, we frame this using, this is framed using two uh, concepts and theories. The first one that I'm going to talk about is equity mindedness. And equity mindedness is a concept that was coined by Estella Ben Simone and colleagues. Um, it refers to a mode of thinking by equity minded practitioners who are willing to engage in four tenets. And that first tenet is being able to assess your own racialized assumptions. Um, secondly, acknowledging our own lack of knowledge in the history of race and racism. Next, um, an equity-minded practitioner will be able to take responsibility for the success of historically underserved and minoritized groups. And then last, a, an equity-minded practitioner will be able to critically assess racialization in their own practices as educators or administrators. The next uh, concept or theoretical perspective that is used to help to think about or in, and analyze the way that faculty are engaging in equity and anti-racism here at AU is culturally responsive pedagogy and teaching. Culturally responsive pedagogy is the work of Dr. Geneva Gay. And it uses the cultural characteristics, experiences, and perspectives of ethnically diverse students as conduits for teaching them more effectively. It is based on the assumption that when the academic knowledge and skills of students are situated within their lived experiences, funds of knowledge, 
and the frames of references of students, that, that students have more personally meaningful experiences, they have higher interest appeal, and they are learning more easily and thoroughly. Um, culturally responsive teaching has four teacher pillars of practice and eight student outcomes. And these teacher pillars of practice um, revolve around um, teachers showing care and that being exhibited in their expectations, uh, culturally responsive communication, um, including diverse content in the, into the curriculum and using um, culturally congruent and diverse instructional strategies um, to teach our students. A culturally responsive teacher would um, expect the following eight outcomes, not all together, but um, in their students. So they would expect the student to be validated, um, have a comprehensive education, to have a learning that en encompasses multiple dimensions, to be empowered, to have a transformative experience, to be emancipatory, to be humanistic and to be normative and ethical. And so while we don't, I don't extensively go through a uh, culturally responsive uh, framework and the details of that, um, we, this framework and um, equity mindedness are used to help us to undergird the experiences of faculty and, and understanding how they address uh, 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 anti-racism and equity. And so we made the following methodological uh, considerations. Um, we chose for our study to be a qualitative study because qualitative methods allowed us to understand, to interrogate, and to really capture rich experiences from our participants. Um, we used purposeful sampling because we were really interested in uh, faculty, both term and tenure, and understanding how they address uh, equity and anti-racism. Our participants uh, were faculty that participated in FLCs, or faculty learning communities, from the past five years, and they ranged in terms of race and gender, and they came from cross discipl disciplines um, and represented different um, perspectives. And we used uh, interview protocols, transcripts, videos, and, and memos as our data sources. Uh, in working with our uh, faculty participants, we asked them questions such as, what types of activities or assignments do you engage in to help your students to become academically successful? And in asking these questions, one of the salient um, things that came from faculty is that they really appreciated having the space to think about uh, what things they were doing really well in terms of centering equity and anti-racism. But also they were happy to think about um, areas where it gave them an opportunity to, to think about areas where they also needed improvement or areas where they were not even giving any energy to at all. And so um, in that vein, we wanted to, uh, we thought it important to create a space also for faculty, for our participants here to think about um, how are we addressing racism and equity in our own teaching. And so I'm going to pause um, from sharing our findings and invite each of our participants to participate with us by reflecting upon the following um, question. What concrete steps do I take to signal the importance of equity and anti-racism? And you can think about that in terms of your teaching, your research, or your service. And so in thinking about this general question, I would like for us all to address the question by focusing on two um, sub-questions. The first being, where is equity and anti-racism reflected in my teaching? And then how do I evaluate equity and anti-racism in my teaching? And for those of us who are not teaching, we can draw upon our experiences as researchers or our experiences um, in doing service. 
And so I am going to try to put everyone into breakout rooms. Nazia, could you help me to, to do that? Yes, of course. Um, how many rooms would you like? Or how many participants per room? Okay, so um, we've got about 22, so maybe five, maybe uh, four participants per room, four groups of four or five. Sounds good. And I'm going to drop the questions in for everyone. Nazia, do you think that everyone, can you speak a little bit about how you are, um, if you're working with your students around equity and anti-racism, how are you uh, evaluating that you're in fact doing what you say that you are doing? Yeah, it's a great question. I'm not sure that the evaluation part is really there. Um, again, because it's different than, than teaching a course, we're supporting um, students in affinity spaces, we are doing programming with outside organizations like Jews for Racial and Economic Justice, um, things like that. Um, we, we, we haven't really had a chance to put any sort of like assessment in place, but, but that's definitely an, an area to be considering. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, who else wants to weigh in? How are we, what are we thinking about um, just staying in that vein? What are we thinking about evaluating, making sure that if we say that we are addressing racism or anti-racism and equity, how are we evaluating that? Let's weigh in here. We talked about how, um, how important it is to kind of make that a continual process. And that it's not something you can just do at the start of a project or the start of uh, like, I, I don't, um, I'm not teaching right now. Um, I'm the director of sustainability on campus. And so in our office, we work really hard to make sure when we talk about environmental problems, we don't just talk about like its impact on green things, but also on people and, um, and specifically which people are, are being impacted. And so we really uh, try to go back and kind of constantly review our programs to make sure that we're incorporating environmental racism and environmental justice in a meaningful and uh, impactful way. Um, and it's something that we are new to and we know we don't have it right yet. And so kind of providing lots of opportunities to renew it and re review it with, with different people has been really helpful for us and making just it a continual process. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Megan. I was also in a group with Megan and she took it from the sustainability viewpoint and um, that was really interesting. Um, I'm new faculty here, very new faculty, my second day, I guess. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it, it's really hard to, well, it's not obvious to incorporate anti-racism in math education, but I do try to teach how math was taught in different indigenous populations so that we're not going completely from a Western worldview. And even my course materials and what I'm pulling from may not 
be on the forefront of what is published or what is referred to, but it may, um, there might be other aspects of math, um, math education that can, that are relevant um, to the edu um, to my students. In terms of evaluating, evaluation is a tough word and something so gray. Um, I think that might be gray, but if there's misalignment with kind of the instructor and the students, maybe through student surveys, maybe through, you know, standards assessments, um, then maybe anti creating that anti-racism um, experience may be evaluated as poor. Um, if, if, but it'd be evaluated highly if the opposite occurred. But evaluation is a tough word to put on such a growing field. Thank you. Thank you for that. Who else wants to weigh in about where um, anti-racism and equity are reflected or how they are evaluating? Dr. Watkins. Yes. So I really like what the last person just said. That was, that just brought, it warmed my heart in a way that somebody else is also teaching from other lenses. And I know, even though I'm not teaching right now, when I did teach research methods, particularly qualitative research, I tried to use other scholars, other black and brown scholars um, their work and their research so that it's not such, as we were just saying a minute ago, a Western lens. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just so, so important to introduce students to that work. And it's also even more important to incorporate um, Black and Brown scholars into our own work. So mm -hmm. exactly. Yes. Thank you for that. And just and monitoring the messages in the chat regarding math, making sure that um, disciplines like math are seen as as a discipline that everyone can be successful in. So yes, exactly. Yes. Does someone have their hand? Up? Is your hand raised? No. I wanted Hannah? to uh, build off of what Tiffany just said. So in in our room, what also came up is that unfortunately, sometimes um, depending on what discipline you're teaching or what what thing you're teaching, there aren't scholars of color, black and brown scholars to draw from. And then that's a conversation to have with your students too. Just like, why are certain voices not represented in the literature or not as well? Or why does the textbook only include these frameworks and these scholars? Um, and why are these the ones we gravitate towards? And what are the, like, what views are we missing? What perspectives are we missing because of the history of this discipline? And so, yeah whether or not, if there's a reason you can't incorporate it, talking about that reason and unpacking that and critiquing that. Uh, yeah, Shade, I love this comment. Exactly. It makes me think about like the framework, you know, equity mindedness, right? And so we think about those tenets of like really us understanding the history of race and racism, you know, in our own disciplines, right? And, and I know that in my interactions with faculty, you know, this is something that's talked about, you know, and um, how to, you know, that the absence of scholars of color in the mainstream literature, right? And so sometimes we have to go outside of mainstream literature um, or, or, or engage in activities um, where our students are critiquing who, who is present, right, in the curriculum or who is present in the literature and, and why is that, right? So, really giving our, our students opportunities to participate um, in that deep interrogation, right? Um, oh, someone's raising their hand. Yes, Rosalind, hi. Hi, thank you. Uh, so I'm Rosalind Donald. I'm incoming faculty at SOC. Um, Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, that actually, so Hannah's point made me think of something that um, that I've been trying to teach more, which is um, the ways in which kind of the, the uh, our, like our mental models can also be modeled on um, kind of uh, Western colonialism. So I teach a difference, I teach like the transmission model of communication, for example, which um, 
um, uh, the, um, sort of communication scholars have linked to um, kind of uh, colonial conquest um, and the the sort of uh, administration of empires and the way that that can actually affect how we think about the world. Um, when um, I don't know, for example, if you're thinking about health communication and um, and populations that are resistant, you can kind of um, it it sort of um, there's the idea that you just need to communicate differently or you need to find like the right kind of message when actually perhaps um, thinking about the systemic ways in which communication itself can be discriminatory um, isn't always kind of interrogated. And so I, I use environmental justice as an example um, where um, you, um, you have populations who may not be receptive to kind of the dominant um, portrayals of environmentalism but that doesn't have to do but that that doesn't mean that um you know marginalized populations are anti-environmental it just means that they have different experiences and they're not reflected in the in the mass media um and so like trying to kind of investigate those mental models as well as the as what as well as the kind of products of them in a way mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i really like that yes thank you thinking about these re resources that we draw upon. Anyone else um, want to share? I just um, wanted to add uh, to the conversation. So when it, I, I teach you know, English to international students, as well as uh, intercultural studies. So, but when it comes to language teaching, um, it's, it, and it's not really racism or anti-racism. I don't think it has anything to do with that. I think it, it's more an equity issue that um, even the field is still a little bit struggling with, but I think it's going towards the right direction is like, I remember when we were evaluating students um, and their listening skills, and they like they were not allowed to, or we were not allowed to put on subtitles when they had to listen to a video. And it was just purely, you know, if you have great audio skills, then you were good. Or sometimes um, they were not even allowed to see, so there was no, you know, visual, just just the recording. And then they had to do like a comprehension activity. And of course, that that was you know, completely against equity because those students who had any issues, um, who needed a little bit of assistance were always failing those, um, those tests. Um, but also when it comes to writing, um, I, you know, every now and then I still um, run into teachers who, for instance, don't allow students to use spell checkers and, um, and just sort of evaluate their spelling or, you know, grammar errors when, you know, there are tools out there these days that can really help you with writing. Mm -hmm. And, um, and sometimes English language learners are sort of denied that um, assistance. And, and so I think that that really goes against equity as well. And so I think that technology really does help, uh, you know, language learning, but sometimes we're just not, you know, ready to hand it over to the students. And, and I understand that the apprehension that you just don't know if it's really helping or if it's just, you know, doing the work for the student, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, but I guess a good balance could, um, could help them progress, but that, that's, that's something that in my field I can see as, you know, lack of equity, but there are digital tools and then we sometimes deny them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone have any additional comments um, that they would like to share regarding ways that equity and anti-racism are represented or ways that um, you are evaluating yourself.
Well, there will be some additional opportunities to participate in the conversation. So I'm going to um, share my screen again. Hopefully you all can see it. Yes, thumbs up, someone. Yeah, yes. Perfect. Okay. So thank you all for engaging in those reflections. Um, and um, many of the, the responses that you all shared are similar to some of the responses that our fellow faculty have shared. And so um, in thinking about advancing equity and addressing um, anti-racism. And so um, I want to share a few of the ways that our colleagues are thinking about that. And so um, these are findings from a study, from the study, um, again, that we did with faculty who participated in, in faculty learning communities. And so there were several or five salient themes um, that emerged from the data. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to present the themes here and then I will further nuance the themes with examples um, from, from faculty. Um, I won't share many examples, um, but the examples that are chosen are representative of the majority of faculty. And so uh, the first finding um, that faculty felt helped them to think about advancing equity and anti-racism at AU was employing culturally responsive curriculum. And so um, in this, in, in this, in this theme, faculty really talked about uh, the importance of um, making connections to students uh, by drawing upon their lived experiences and their funds of knowledge. And, and, and really um, thinking about that teaching occurs by making connections to students in these ways. And so uh, the quote that I'll present to you today is from David who was a term faculty. And he's, he talks about the importance of not making assumptions and that just um, not making assumptions and giving students an opportunity to participate is just good teaching. And so um, I will read it here. Um, it says that for us, making fewer assumptions and doing more to explain background and to ask about the background and culture of our students, including who might say this um, is like something else they had experience with and allowing those digressions because they have something to offer that I think, you know, is generally good teaching. And it made me aware of like the importance of going outside of the lanes because students have their own perspectives and how they want to apply the rules. And that's a good thing. And so when we think about um, culturally responsive teaching or culturally responsive uh, curriculum, it can take on many forms. But the important thing is that when we're um, engaging in culturally responsive teaching is that the curriculum, the instruction and the learning must be tied to the students' experiences, their realities, their identities their culture, their histories. And so we see this exuded um, with David um, and him talking about the ways that how he doesn't make assumptions for students, but he allows students to bring in their own experiences and apply the concepts to them in meaningful ways. And so our second salient theme has to do with increase, increasing racial literacy. So many of the faculty um, found that increasing their racial literacy was one way in which they were able to um, address equity in anti-racism. And so uh, the excerpt that I have here is from Marcel, who is also a term faculty. And um, in this um, excerpt, uh, uh, Marcel is talking about the importance of having language to be able to think about equity and anti-racism. And so when we think about racial literacy, racial literacy is defined as the ability to read, to recast, reduce, or resolve racially stressful encounters during face-to-face -face interactions. And so Marcel uh, starts, talking, starts talking and she says, 
I'm definitely better at recognizing the inconsistencies when someone is trying to preserve the structures that got us here. So I'm much better and I feel more confident saying, hey, I have language. Um, and using this language to say, hey, we're not thinking about equity. Um, you know, we're not thinking about how the systems that we have in place are maintaining structures in place and maintaining the same type of people in the system like that. So language, um, using the language, it's not what we want to be thinking about. And so I definitely gain confidence. So in increasing racial literacy in this theme, many of the faculty talked about the importance of having language and how having the language not only helped them um, feel confident, but helped them to be empowered, to be able to be um, advocates for their students and thinking about um, ways to address uh, equity and center anti-racism in their teaching. And so the next theme is building positive relationships. Um, so the faculty in this theme talked about the importance of building meaningful and positive relationships. And so when we think about the importance of positive relationships, um, learning, it's important to know that learning um, does not occur without, it's very relational. And so it doesn't occur uh, without relationship building. And so the faculty in this theme really talked about the ways that they build relationships with their students. So here we have an excerpt from Millie, who was also a term faculty. And she talks about um, how she was intentional and the types of steps she took to form or build relationships with their students. So she says, I've taken some purposeful kind of concrete steps to try to improve how I teach, but I'm being more vulnerable. I recognize that, you know, if I show up as the person who's just really committed to trying to do the best I can, and I open to the fact that I don't have all the answers. In fact, I have a few um, that I could learn as much from my students. Um, as I could teach them and that we're in this together and we're just going to explore these issues and do the best we can to solve these problems. And so um, in when I was popping in and out of the groups, I think I heard one of the groups talking about showing up as teachers and being vulnerable and, and, and how that does set a tone and helps to contribute to the type of classroom that you said. So here we see that Millie is really talking about being intentional in building relationships with her students. Um, the fourth theme that we think about or that was salient is collaborating with colleagues. And so, and we see collaborating with colleagues, um, many of we think about collaborating with colleagues um, either can be formal or an informal communities of practice. And a community of practice is defined by Lob and Winger as a group of people who congregate or share um, a concern or passion for a topic, a craft, or a profession. And so by being in community with each other, um, these individuals deepen their knowledge and their expertise through regular interactions with each other. And so this excerpt is reflective of many of the faculty, but in this excerpt, Hazel really talks about the importance of being in community, being in a community of practice with her colleagues to be able um, as, a, as a system or as a resource that helps to propel her in thinking about equity. And so she says, uh, you know, it's really great to, to go to a lecture or a workshop and to read uh, papers um, around equity and racism. But I really think for me, talking to colleagues and not just any colleagues, but colleagues who are who you have trust, trusted colleagues that have similar experiences. Um, and that you can bounce ideas off of and you can say, what do you think? How can I adjust this? Or I'd like to bring this particular topic and try to include more conversation or discussion into the classroom. And so she says, yes, talking with folks about it. And so for Hazel, being able to be in community with colleagues and to grapple with ideas um, and, 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 and forming, and not only just in community, but 
having trusted uh, relationships with colleagues was really important to her. And the fifth um, salient thing was the creation of counter spaces. And so um, when we think about counter spaces, what is a counter space? And so counter spaces can be described as academic or social sites where deficit notions of people of color can be challenged and where a positive racial uh, collegiate climate, climate can be established and maintained. And so counter spaces uh, can be created along lines of race and gender. They can exist as formal, like maybe a school organization or informal um, structures like peer relationships. Um, they often are identity confirming spaces that serve as a positive resistance strategy for responding to racism. And so in, in this excerpt, um, um, counter uh, June, a term faculty, is talking about how she tries to, I think, create a safe space, a counter space for her students. So she says uh, through her mentoring. And so she says, meeting people where they are from a cultural perspective and understanding where your students are, getting to know them so that they have kind of a space, a safe space. A lot of that is like relationship building, like relational trust. Um, do they have my trust? Do I have they tr their trust? And so if I don't have trust or if a student is having a hard time engaging, what do I do differently? Um, and so counter spaces can, can be um, institutions themselves can be counter spaces. There is literature that talks about the ways um, and thinking about Black students, how historically Black colleges and universities as institutions serve as counter spaces. There's also literature that, that talks about the way specific departments and disciplines like STEM departments can be counter spaces. Uh, peer structures or peer relationships can be counter spaces. Mentoring relationships can be counter spaces. So here we see an example of through her, I think, mentoring of her students that June is trying to create um, a counter space. And so um, I'm going to go back here and to think about, you know, again, these are the ways that are the salient findings um, and talking of, and talking with our faculty and how our faculty are uh, continuing to advance equity in anti-racism at AU. And so as I share these findings, I hope that you too are thinking about, you know, how am I, what type of equity focused curriculum am I using? If it's not culturally responsive, you know, how am I increasing uh, my racial literacy? What do, how am I building relationships with all of my students, including those um, from marginalized populations? What do my collaborations with colleagues lo look like, particularly the ones that support me in thinking about um, equity and anti-racism? And how am I creating spaces, counter spaces where, stu where students can thrive? Um, and so um, I um, am going to stop sharing here. Can. Okay. Um, am I seeing everyone now? Did I stop sharing with you? Or are you all seeing me now? Yes. Okay. All right. And so um, I'm going to stop here just to leave space for um, questions that anyone have may have around. Um, the, the, the ways or the salient things that faculty here at AU are engaged in to advance equity and anti-racism. I'm going to also monitor, yes. 